Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session on fundamentals of criminal law. Um, I'm Bijetri Roy. I'm an instructional designer at EBC Learning. And uh, this particular session on fundamentals of criminal law is also brought to you by EBC Learning, which is EBC's educational initiative where we provide on-demand legal education. The objectives of EBC Learning are to help remove the hurdles to legal education, to empower you to make life-changing moves, and of course, to help you learn and win. Now, for all those who are not uh, aware of our platform, our platform is ebclearning.com. So um, before we uh, start with this session, I'll uh, quickly share my screen. And uh, I'll uh, just for a few moments, I'll show our uh, website to all of you. So, so uh, for all our participants today who have not yet uh, explored our platform, this is ebclearning.com's uh, platform. You can subscribe to ebclearning.com. There is a button on the right hand side to do so. And uh, apart from uh, all these webinars that we are organizing nowadays, which, uh, which are available on YouTube, uh, we have a number of uh, courses that are available on our platform. So we have um, different uh, courses which are uh, related to different aspects of law, which are related to different practical aspects for legal practitioners, for young professionals, as well as for uh, people who are uh, probably just wanting to explore some, uh, uh, some topics such as consumer laws, or probably, uh, as you can see on my screen, changing name of natural and artificial legal persons, or if you are interested in uh, insolvency laws, we have a number of uh, courses which are available for that as well. We also have a course on arbitration. Uh, now, apart from this, uh, of course, uh, we have our uh, YouTube channel. Our uh, YouTube channel is, uh, uh, is uh, again, EBC Learning. So you can subscribe to YouTube channel. And uh, you can, of course, press on the bell icon to get uh, notifications every time we upload something new. And uh, again, I'll uh, just repeat this for uh, those who are not aware, this uh, session as well as the other webinar sessions that we are holding nowadays, these are all available on demand and they are available on YouTube. And even right now, uh, this particular uh, video is streaming live on YouTube. So you can probably share the details of that with your friends and family later on. Now, to quickly tell you about uh, today's guest today, uh, we have with us Kapil Madan. He's the partner at KMA Law Offices in Delhi, and uh, he has an extensive experience in litigation. He specializes in white collar crimes, cross-border processes and criminal proceedings, corporate criminal liability, corruption cases, arbitration, civil and commercial disputes, to name a few. Now, uh, in this particular session, just for uh, those who joined in late, I had already uh, mentioned it in the chat tab, that if you have any questions or queries during this session, please post your questions and queries in the chat tab, which is at the bottom of your player. And we will take up your questions and queries during this uh, session. And uh, at last, I would again like to encourage all of you to give your wholehearted participation today. And uh, now coming to today's session, we will cover the fundamental aspects of criminal law. And some of the important concepts, uh, I guess that uh, Kapil uh, would be covering would of course include how the criminal justice system is set into motion, like filing of complaints, meaning of the word cognizance, differences between state case and private complaint case, investigation and overview of trials and so on. Now this webinar will enable all of you to get a bird's eye view of the practical aspects of the criminal justice system. Now, um, uh, without delaying much, I'll uh, now hand it over to you, Kapil. Uh, you can start with today's session. Yeah, very good evening to everyone. So, you know, as Bijetri has you know, already introduced, my name is uh, Kapil Madan. I graduated in 2010, started working with a company called V. De Costa and Law Offices. We used to uh, primarily work, you know, uh, at the trial court. Thereafter, in 2011, I started working with Luthra and Luthra, where I was primarily doing uh, criminal litigation. And since 2018, I'm doing my own uh, practice. And my firm's name is KMA Law Offices. 
So I would like to begin this uh, webinar by extending uh, a thank you to the entire team of EBC Learning and Vijayatri who have taken great initiative to you know, put this together. And I would like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to all the uh, attendees of this webinar. You already say that you know a million miles journey is always begin by one uh, small step. So I would start this webinar by a very small step of the criminal litigation. That is uh, how you draft a criminal complaint. So I will just share uh, my screen. Okay. Yeah. So. Whenever you are drafting your criminal complaint, always ensure that you give accurate description of the parties. Always take some time out and ask these questions. Who the parties are, what they have done, when they have done, where they have done, and how they have done. Now, if you are drafting a complaint where somebody has caused any bodily injury, let's say for an example that two people have uh, caused any grievous hurt to anyone, so whenever you are drafting a complaint, you should, ensure, you should ensure and you should detail specific role played by each of such individual. Now, there could be a situation that in a criminal, uh, in, in a case where, you know, one person was only hitting and the other one was already, was only instigating, or he might have, you know, hold the accused, uh, hold the complainant, and the other might have been, you know, hitting him with a uh, rod or something. So you need to ensure that you have to detail specific individual role played by each accused person while you are drafting your complaint. Always make it a point that your complaint satisfies all the ingredients of the offense. Now, take an example of 420, which is a case of cheating, which is defined under section 415 of the IPC. So in a case of cheating, it is always that there has to be a fraudulent, there has to be a fraudulent and dishonest intention at the time of beginning of the transaction. So in your complaint, you should clearly say that when the accused approach and whenever they gave you representation, their intention was to cheat from the very inception. If you don't write it in your complaint, the offense of cheating is not made out. So always take great pain in ensuring that your complaint satisfies all the ingredients of the offense. Now, once your complaint is ready, what do you do? So every place has a police station. Every place will have a jurisdiction. Every police station will have a, a jurisdiction over a particular area. So wherever the offense has been committed, you first you will see which is the appropriate police station where you can file the complaint. Once you have that information with you, you should take your complaint and you should lodge it before the police station. Normally what they do is they will take your uh, complaint and they will give you an acknowledgement in the form of a daily diary. So there would be a number that will be given and there would be an acknowledgement uh, on a copy of the complaint that you will, uh, that a copy will be given to you. Now, We've seen in practice that, you know, police is usually reluctant to register an FIR. So if your complaint discloses a cognizable offense, and despite that, police is not registering your, your FIR. So as per section 155, 154.3, you need to send a substance of the complaint to the superintendent of the police, concerned superintendent of the police. Also, I would also like you to uh, read a judgment for Lalita Kumari versus government of UP. The citation is already there at the PPT. That is 2014 to SEC 1. The judgment has made it amply clear that if the complaint disclosed commission of incognizable offense, then it is the obligation of the police authorities to register the FIR. However, just to clarify, the judgment also talks about an exception where in matrimonial case cases or in a commercial you know, cases, uh, the police can conduct a pre preliminary investigation before they formally register the FIR. Now, also, you should be careful and you should be mindful of the fact that if your complaint discloses a commission of any non-cognizable offense, the police cannot register an FIR without 
a direction of the magistrate. You have to see section 155.2 and example of such one such non-cognizable offense is section 427, which is causing mischief to a particular property. Now, if somebody, uh, you know, has caused any damage to your property, if you go to the police, what they will do is they will give you a non-cognizable report. So meaning thereby you have to approach a magistrate to get an order of uh, investigation and then only the police can register and FIR and investigate. Now, if you have filed a complaint before the police authorities and you know if they are reluctant to uh, register your FIR, then what do you need to do? So as per section 156.3 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, you need to file a petition before the concerned uh, magistrate's court. So as every area has you know, a police station, Every on every police station, there is a jurisdiction of one particular magistrate. So your 156.3 will be filed before the court of magistrate that exercises jurisdiction over that particular police station. So once you file your 156.3, you will, you know, your case will come up for arguments and you will argue before the court that your application or your complaint discloses a cognizable offense. And despite that, the police has not registered an FIR. So what the court will do, court will seek a report from the concerned uh, police station. So on the next date of hearing, the investigating officer who is assigned to your case will come before the court and he will give his action taken report and he will detail what action he has taken on your complaint. And uh, he may give his conclusion whether the case is made out or whether the case is not made out or if you know there are no evidence in support of your uh, complaint so once the court hears the objection and your you know uh, complaint the court will apply its own mind and will decide if the if if the information and the facts discloses the commission of any cognizable offenses the court will register an fir now you need to be mindful of the fact that the court though there may be a cognizable offense made out in the complaint, the court may still not register an FIR. So this is a situation where, uh, where if the court is of the view that all the material evidence is in the possession of the complainant, no further invest, no further uh, evidence is required, or you know, police intervention is not required in collection of the evidence. So in that situation, the court may decline to register an FIR and may treat your case as a complaint case which will be uh, taken, which will be uh, proceeded further as per chapter chapter 15 of CRPC under section 200. I remember during my initial days, I was arguing, I, 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 my senior uh, requested me to seek an uh, adjournment in the court and I went, it was a 156.3 application. And I just sought an adjournment and the judge told me that, you know, we are dismissing your uh, 156.3 and we are proceeding as a complaint case. So at that point in time, I was very young, three months in the profession. I couldn't understand what he has done. So I have requested the court not to dismiss the uh, dismiss my application. And upon my insistence, the judge himself explained me the procedure. So uh, the idea is that you, the, all your youngsters who are not aware about this law should should read this judgment called Skipper Beverages Private Limited versus State 2001 SEC Online, where the court has let down the law in what circumstances the court should register an FIR or in what circumstances the court should rather proceed as a complaint case. Now, another important aspect. Please hold on. Now, another important aspect in a criminal trial is the power of arrest. It was seen and observed that, you know, the police was exercising this power of arrest mechanically and they were uh, exercising this power arbitrarily and in a bizarre manner. So if you read section 41 of the CRPC and specifically section 41, 1 sub clause B that talks about where, where a police officer can arrest you without a warrant in cognizable offenses punishable with less than seven years. Similarly, section 41C enumerates factors to be borne in mind while arresting an accused for commission of cognizable offenses, which are punishable more than seven years. I would also like to draw your attention to a judgment called Arnesh Kumar versus State, wherein the, wherein the Honorable Supreme Court 
noted down the uh, the misuse of uh, 4998A of uh, Indian Penal Code, which is a dowry harassment case. It was observed that you know in that in 498 complaint, typically a girl will implicate all family members, and there was a threat of arrest. And it was observed that in fact uh, several family members of any family was being arrested by the cops in such case. So while explaining, uh, while dealing with section 41A, the court in Arnesh Kumar's judgment clarified that if there's an offense which is punishable with less than seven years, there should not be any mechanical arrest. And in fact, the court also mandated the cops to strictly follow the procedure let down under section 41 while they are uh, doing any arrest. Also, you need to be, you know, very careful of Section 46.4 of CRPC, which says that no woman can be arrested after sunset or before sunrise. So you may read a Bombay High Court's judgment, which is directly on this point, Kavita Manikar versus CBI. So this was a case uh, related with PNB scam, wherein one uh, one of the officer of PNB, who was stated to be uh, an accused in the scam was arrested at 8.30. The accused challenged the uh, arrest before the Honorable High Court and contended that her arrest is illegal in view of section 40, 46 sub, sub clause 4 of CRPC and the Honorable Court agreed with their submission and it was held that such arrest is illegal. Also, I would like you to uh, be careful of the fact that if there are emergent circumstances which requires that a woman should be arrested after sunset. So in that situation, section 46.4 says that you need to have a prior permission of the magistrate before you do that arrest. So another important aspect is bail. So in a bailable offense, bail is granted as a matter of right. So if you see, there is a schedule uh, with Code of Criminal Procedure, that is Schedule 1, that enumerates in detail what all offenses are bailable and what all offenses are non-bailable. That also enumerates what all offenses are cognizable and what all offenses are non-cognizable. So if your client is facing any criminal, any criminal case and the section is bailable in nature, so you will go before the court, you will furnish your bail bond, and you will get a bail as a matter of right. It is not a discretion of the court. Now, one such example of such kind of an offense is an offense punishable under Section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act, which provides that the accused can be punished with a uh, uh, with an imprisonment of two years or double the check amount of the fine. The offense is bailable in nature. Therefore, if your client is facing any case under section 138, he will just appear before the court, he will furnish his bail bond and he will, you know, furnish a surety and bail is given as a matter of right. So section 437 of the code of uh, criminal procedure talks about in what cases bail can be given in a non bailable offenses. Though bail is a discretionary relief, however, the court have taken into consideration following factors while exercising that discretion. And one is, and, and these factors are, what are the nature of the evidence in support of the case, severity of the punishment, the character behavior means standing of the accused, circumstances which are peculiar to the accused, reasonable possibility of securing the presence of the accused at the trial, reasonable apprehension of the witnesses being tempered with, the larger interest of the public, or, or state and similar other consideration. So typically, if your client is arrested and he's already behind bars, and if you're arguing his bail application, you can argue that you know the evidence which is available is, is very feeble. There are not enough evidence available or it's a frivolous case again, uh, instituted against your client. The character, the behavior of you know, your, uh, your client, his standing in the society, you can also demonstrate that that he has deep root in the society and there are no chances that he will flee. And also you will also uh, argue that your, your client is able to furnish adequate surety 
So that will ensure that he is available during the course of the trial. So now next, I would talk about uh, anticipatory bail. So anticipatory bail is basically a bail uh, filed by a person who is not yet arrested. However, he is apprehending an arrest. So you need to be you need to be very careful. And whenever you're filing an anticipatory bail, you you have to ensure that you know the offenses which are there in your against your client are non-bailable. I was arguing, I was standing in the court and I uh, noticed one gentleman filed an anticipatory bail for bailable offense. No such uh, uh, anticipatory anticipatory bail is maintainable in you know such kind of uh, cases because. Your client will get bail as and when he is arrested as a matter of right. So these are the following factors that that are taken into consideration while dealing with the anticipatory bail application. And you may also note down one judgment on these aspects from where we have taken these uh, factors. That is Gurbaksh Singh Sibia. One judgment on anticipatory bail is Gurbaksh Singh Sibia, and the second judgment is uh, Satlingappa Mehtre. So these two judgments, they basically lay down and uh, uh, details the entire law on uh, anticipatory bail. And you can read these conditions, the nature and the gravity of the acquisition, exact goal of the accused, antecedents of the applicant, possibility of the applicant to flee from justice, possibility of the accused likelihood to repeat the similar offense, impact of grant of anticipatory bail in cases of large magnitude, and also whether there are any chances that the accused will tamper with the you know uh, evidence or whether they will influence any uh, witness or prosecution witness to name a few so also if there is an fir the police will proceed and will investigate the case so investigation into the crime is a prerogative of the police if you read mr chinamaram's case recently you know which was decided by the supreme court the court again clarified that the police has unfettered power to investigate. The court cannot direct the manner of investigation. Police has unfettered powers. However, if you are appearing for the complainant, there could be a situation, you know, we've seen uh, in many cases where, you know, uh, though there is an FIR, however, the police is taking abnormal time to investigate the matter. So in that situation, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court in Sakiri Vasu's case, you may write down Sakiri Vasu's case, the Honorable Supreme Court said that the power under 156.3 of the Code of Criminal Procedure also contains the power to monitor such investigation. So typically, if the cops are not investigating your case, you can file another 156.3 before the court and you can seek an order against the cops to uh, you can seek an order against the cop and the court to monitor the investigation typically what will happen court will again ask for a you know status update and the police officials would be under an obligation to report the status of the investigation also you need to ensure you, you need to be mindful of the fact that monitoring of the investigation ceases as and when charge sheet, charge sheet is filed. So charge sheet is filed. After that, there is no monitoring of investigation. Also, you should read a judgment called Vinay Tyagi versus Irshad Ali. Though the power under 156.3 includes the power to monitor the investigation. However, the court of magistrate has no power to direct the police officers to conduct a de novo investigation. Such power is exercised only by the constitutional courts, i.e. Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court. You, you may refer to Vinay Tyagi versus Rishad Ali. This judgment details and explain what is de novo trial, what is uh, reinvestigation, what is further investigation, and power of the magistrates to do, uh, to pass any such order on these aspects. So what happens once once the uh, investigation is over? So once the investigation is over, the, the police will come to a conclusion 
and they will file their conclusion in the form of charge sheet. So it is basically the finding of the cops and the finding of the investigation. Once the charge sheet is filed, along with the charge sheet, the IO will supply all material documents as contemplated under section 170 of the CRPC. And uh, again, you know, the charge sheet is basically a conclusion by the IO. The IO may also file a closure report concluding that no offense is made out. If you may recall, in Arushi Talwar's case, the CBI initially filed a closure report stating that they don't have enough evidence to proceed against anyone. However, the court is not bound by the charge sheet. The court may accept the report. The court may reject the report. So if the police says that, you know, X offense is made out. However, if the court is considering, uh, after considering the material on record, considers that no, not only X, Y offense is also made out. The court is well within its power to summon the accused for both X and Y offenses. Also, while taking the cognizance, if the court, you know, comes to a finding that not only A, B has also committed an offense. However, the police has not uh, made B as an accused. The court is well within its right to take cognizance against uh, uh, cognizance of the offense against A as well as well as against B. So, Bijayatri, we can take yeah. questions till here. Yeah. So um, till now, because uh, till now we were basically discussing the very basic and fundamental concepts of criminal law. Before we move on to the more uh, procedural aspects, I think uh, we can take up some questions. So um, one of the first uh, questions that uh, is very important and pertinent is uh, what is the difference between uh, registering a complaint and registering an FIR? Can you come again, please? Uh, difference between registering a complaint and registering an FIR. See, what happens is when you uh, go to a police, right, you just give your complaint. Complaint is in the form of information to the police. Once the complaint is there, you know, the court will, the, the police will see whether the, you know, cognizable offense is made out. Upon your complaint, an FIR will be registered. So, in practical sense, what happens is usually the cops reiterate the content of the complaint and then they have a strict format you know of registering and registering the fir wherein name date time name of the accused name of the complainant you know all those things are mandatory to be written and then you know fir is registered we, we can take the next question yeah uh, now uh, the next question is uh, uh, somebody uh, from our uh, audience uh, wants you to uh, repeat a bit about the basic concept of anticipatory bail yeah, okay. I'll just give you a quick, uh, you know, recap. So anticipatory bail is filed by an individual who is not yet arrested. He is apprehending arrest. Now, for example, if you learn that one of your client has filed a case against you, and there is an FIR registered against you, and the police is calling you for, you know, investigation. So now in that particular situation, you are not yet arrested, but there is a great chance you will get arrested. And in that situation, you will file an anticipatory bail under Section 438 uh, before the course of session. Yeah. Um, now, uh, another question that we have received is, uh, what is a C-summary report? I'm sorry? A C-summary report. C-summary report. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the question. I don't think the question yeah. is framed. Uh... Um, um, Dear participants, uh, the question is, uh, the question that has been posted by one of you is, uh, what is a C summary report? So if you could please elaborate uh, in the chat box what exactly you want to ask. Or we so may we'll take move... question in the end. Yeah, we'll so we'll just, yeah. yeah. We'll so we'll uh, move on to the next uh, question very quickly. Can a complaint be made to the magistrate directly if the police refuses to accept the complaint? Right, so uh, yes, you can do that. So what happens practically is that once you are filing a complaint, once you're filing a petition under section 156, it, you know, we as a matter of practice also file a complaint under section 200 along with it. 
दो वट है मजिस्ट्रेट इज नॉट यू नो इंटरेस्टेड और इफ इज नॉट इंक्लाइन टू पास एन ऑर्डर ऑन वन फिफ्टी सिक्स थ्री he treats your 15663 as a complaint case however as an abandoned caution and as a matter of practice it is always advised that along with your 15663 application you should also file your complaint under section 200 before the magistrate mm-hmm. and you may also as as i say if you are in possession of all the material evidence you may not at all take the police police route and you may directly you know approach the magistrate under section 200 that's completely doable but it is always advised that you take the police report because you know once you you know take that route police has a lot of power to investigate they have powers to you know call for information seize document seize evidences which power is not available to you again if there is a serious offense there is a you know uh, there is a very you know high possibility that the accused will also uh, face the threat of arrest all right uh, so somebody uh, from our participants has just uh, explained what uh, they meant by c summary uh, so basically uh, it's a report uh, it means the fir was registered by the complainant due to a misunderstanding at the same he gave in writing to the police so typically c report so what what i understood is that c report he means a closure report now what happens is that you know uh, you know we'll we'll come you know in fact we we you know detailed in our you know last mm-hmm. slide that you know the cops may also file a closure report right so once the closure report is filed you know as i said that you know the judges you know not bound we've seen in uh, many cases like you know if there is a uh, if there is a poxo case mm-hmm. uh, and you know there is a there is a process already in shaded now tomorrow if the complainant is won over if any witness is won over by the accused and you know in 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 connivance with the you know uh, accused person the police may do that however again the court is not bound by that so we've seen in many cases where the uh, where in the high court have refused to quash an fir on the basis of the settlement to say that you know these are offenses of moral turpitude and despite that there is a settlement we will not quash the fir okay uh, now uh, we'll quickly take uh, two more questions uh, before we proceed so one of the questions again uh, can we have a parallel investigation if the police are uh, lax in investigating see uh, uh, see there is no law on that you may you know we've seen that you know a complainant is largely interested in in pursuing you know his own case we've seen in you know matrimonial cases if it's a case of adultery or you know uh, if 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 there is a case of uh, 420 uh, if any case you know related to forgery of the documents we've seen people uh, you know taking help of uh, private investigators however you need to see if you if you are filing a complaint together with the evidence you need to your evidence should you know test the laws laid down under the evidence act um i think we can uh, now proceed yeah yeah so uh, participants after this uh, next part of the discussion we'll uh, take the rest of the questions so um, again uh, please continue to be patient and uh, have a whole hearted participation and listen to uh, couples uh, explanations and uh, later on towards the end we'll take up all the other questions yeah Yes, so we are you know uh, done with this slide so i as i mentioned earlier if if the charge sheet is filed you know uh, before the court the court is not bound by the contents of the charge sheet the court may accept it the court may reject it the court may summon any additional accused person the court may uh, take cognizance of any other offense which is not uh, stated in the charge sheet and proceed uh, further so one what happens once the charge sheet is filed so once the charge sheet is filed then the court will take cognizance of the offenses so as i have i as i have briefly explained earlier that you know a magistrate can take cognizance of offenses upon receiving a complaint which you know could be a private complaint which is not 
which is not an FIR in the charge sheet, you can you know straight away file a complaint before the magistrate, and the magistrate may take cognizance of the offences. Uh, the magistrate may also take cognizance of offences upon police report, which is nothing but a charge sheet, or the magistrate may take uh, cognizance of any offence upon any information received by him from any other person. Now, if if somebody if someone has died, and if the if, and if the magistrate is informed that so and so person has died an unnatural death, and if the information comes to the magistrate first rather than the, the cops, the magistrate can take cognizance of uh, the offence, or he may also uh, direct the cops to register an FIR and uh, investigate the matter. So, what what do you mean by cognizance of offence? We've we've uh, often uh, heard this term cognizance of offence so cognizance of offence is not being defined under the act so we have taken a, a quote from one of the judgment by the supreme court in state of west bengal versus mohammad ali khan and i will read out the relevant excerpt it says in in its broad and literal sense it means taking notice of an offence this would include the intention of initiating judicial proceeding against the offender in respect of the offence or taking steps to see whether there is any basis for initiating judicial proceedings or other purposes. The word cognizance indicates the point when a magistrate or a judge first takes judicial notice of an offence. It is entirely a different thing from initiation of proceedings. Rather, it is a condition precedence to the initiation of proceedings by the magistrate. So always rem remember, the court does not take cognizance of the offender. The court always take cognizance of the offence. And I would again like to repeat that the court, while taking cognizance, may issue summons against any other person not named in the charge sheet who, in the opinion of the court, has committed any offence. Now, what happens when uh, once the cognizance is taken? The court, after taking the cognizance, issues a process. The process can be in the form of summons or it can be in the form of warrants, and the warrants could be bailable or non bailable. In what circumstances the court may issue summons, and in what court circumstances the court may issue warrants, is elaborately detailed in a judgment called Inder Mohan Goswami. You may read the judgment, entire law on issuance of summons. Warrants and non bailable warrants have been detailed there. Just to give you a brief of the judgment, the court says that at the first instance, the court should endeavor to issue a summons. If there is service of summons, if the accused was served with that document, however, he still fails to appear, then in the second occasion, the court should uh, issue bailable warrant. And if the court is, if the person is not appearing despite issuance, issuance of bailable warrant, the court can issue non billable warrants. So non billable warrants are only executed, they are not served. If there, are, if there is a non billable warrant against X, and if the police finds X, the police is under an obligation to arrest him and to bring him before the court who has issued non billable warrant. So once the accused is before the court, he shall be, he shall be given the copy of the charge sheet together with all the materials relied upon by the prosecution. So charge sheet will typically have copy of the complaint on the basis of which FIR was registered, copy of the FIR, statement of the witnesses, all medical documents, all each and every document on which prosecution seeks to rely to build a case against the accused. So if the offense is tribal by a court of sessions, like offence under section 376, rape, then in that situation, magistrate, after complying with the provision of section 207, that is supply of documents, the court will thereafter uh, commit the matter to the court of sessions. The court of sessions will hear the arguments on charge. So now we'll discuss, you know, what is a trial by a court of session? So let's take an example of section 376, which is rape, which is punishable, uh, which is which is tried by a court of session. Similarly, there are other offenses which are tribal by a court of magistrate. The procedure before procedure of trial before a court of magistrate and before a court of session is slightly different, and it is 
enumerated there is a different chapter for both these trials so for today's purpose i will be taking on uh, uh, trial by a court of sessions so what happens when when the accused is given the copy of the documents and the charge sheet the the prosecution shall open their case and they will re rely on the material available against the accused and the prosecution and both the accused will argue on the point of charge they may argue that on the basis of the material available before the court the case, you know a particular section is made out prima facie is made out or it is not made out so you need to be mindful of the fact that you may have certain document in your possession that will disprove the case of the prosecution however at the time of arguments on charge the court is not and will not hear your defense material which is not on record the court will hear and only hear the material and the evidence filed by the prosecution and nothing else so the law on this point was detailed under a judgment called the binder singh padhi the honorable supreme court clarified that the at the time of argument on charge the accused the material which may be in the possession of the accused that can't be taken into consideration and the charge has to be framed or the decision on charge has to be made only on the basis of the material relied upon by the prosecution so if the court after hearing the arguments on charge comes to a finding that there there are no sufficient grounds for proceeding against the accused the court will discharge the accused so you may read a judgment called un union of india versus proful kumar 1979 3 scc 4 the court while discussing the ambit and applicability of section 227 when that is discharge the court uh, propounded these following parameters the court said that the court may sift and weigh the evidence for the limited purpose of finding out whether the prima facie case is made out against the accused or not if the material filed by the prosecution gives grave suspicion the court is justified in framing of charge however if two views are possible one in favor of the prosecution and one in favor of the accused and the material only gave some suspicion and not grave suspicion then you may argue and the court will well within its rights to discharge the accused discharge means you are your client will be free proceedings will be dropped framing of charge now what happens if the court comes to a finding that the material available uh, against the accused raises grave suspicion and there is a prima facie case that your client has committed the offense then the court will not discharge the accused rather the court will proceed further and frame charge against the accused and your your client will be asked to uh, answer the charge at that particular moment he may either say that yes i plead guilty of the offense or he may say that i don't play uh, i don't plead guilty to the charge i claim trial so if he pleads guilty the court may record the plea and may in his discretion record a conviction now if you if you remember there was one case i faintly remember maybe it was ajmal kasab's case when ajmal kasab's trial was happening so initially he plead pleaded guilty however the court exercises discretion and proceeded with the trial despite the fact that he pleaded guilty so it is the discretion of the court at that uh, moment whether to pronounce a conviction on plea of guilty or give an opportunity of a trial so if the accused does not plead guilty the court shall proceed and will take evidence for prosecution so prosecution evidence and cross examination so whenever the court is recording any evidence as per section 273 it is a mandate that all such evidence needs to be taken in the presence of the accused the cardinal principle of criminal law you may note down these words the cardinal principles of criminal criminal law is that we don't try and accuse in absentia if the accused is not present his trial can't happen 
what will happen is that the court will issue you know non billable warrants proclamation and the court will declare him as a proclaim offender and his trial will begin as and when he is arrested and is brought before the court so always remember this cardinal principle that there is no trial in absence so once the prosecution evidence begins it will include your examination in chief examination in chief is basically if there is a witness the witness will come before the court and he will testify whatever he has whatever he has to say now, for example if he is an eye witness to you know commission of any you know murder uh, case he will testify before the court whatever he has seen on that particular day so how will you impeach his credit so if you read section 155 of the evidence act the credit of the witness can be impeached only by three ways by bringing an evidence that the witness is unworthy of credit by you know bringing some proof before the court that this witness is bribed or he has you know accepted any offer of bribe or you may impeach his credit you may say that he is unworthy of uh, credit by proving that his former statements are inconsistent with what he has stated before the court so while doing a cross examination you should be very very careful and you should you should thoroughly understand the uh, interplay of section 145 section 162 and section 155 so section 162 says when during the investigation the police collects any evidence that and if there is any statement given by the accused that statement cannot be you cannot be used before the court for any other purpose other than what is stated under section 145 so section 145 typically talks about that you can uh, use the previous statements given by the uh, witness for the purpose of contradictions for uh, proving contradictions and how you prove a contradiction now i will i'll give you an example now if 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 there is a murder trial and if the witness gave a statement before the police that he saw a uh, uh, firing a gun to be and consequently be died and before the court he says a a fired gun on the accused and the b also stabbed uh, stabbed the accused so it is it is a it is a contradiction it is a contradiction and what you will do how will you you know prove the contradiction you will show him the previous statement during the course of his examination before the court to say that in in so and so statement from point a to point b you never said anything before b so now there could be two possibilities one possibility is that he may admit that yes in the police uh, in in the statement to the police he has he has not stated about b so in that situation his contradiction is brought on record and his contradiction is proved now there could be another situation he may say that i have an i have never said this to the police that only a has uh, fired fired a shot i never said that so in that situation what you will do your contradiction is brought on record and how will you prove that contradiction you will cross whenever you will cross examination the io you will ask this question whether and you will show his statement and will say whether the statement was made by the accused uh, by, by the witness or not so when the police will police official will say that yes he said that it was a that fired a shot and there was no mention of b so it was it will be a contradiction which will be brought on record and it will be a contradiction that will be proved and while arguing when when you will do your final arguments before the court you will argue that this witness is unworthy of credit is you know his contradiction there are material contradiction in his testimony and therefore he should not be uh, he he should there should there could not be any reliance and he is unworthy of credit now whenever you are cross examining the accused you have to ensure that your defense your defense could be that you know you were not there you know uh, or you never if it's a case of cheating you may say that you know you never had you know uh, any intention to cheat at the inception which is a say sine qua non for the offense of cheating in you have to ensure that whatever your defenses are you are putting your defenses in the form of suggestion to the witnesses 
So once the prosecution evidence is over, the court will proceed to record the statement of the accused. The statement of the accused is recorded uh, under section 313. In While recording the statement of the accused, all incriminating evidence must be put to the accused while recording the statement. And I would like to uh, uh, refer to a judgment called Sunil Clifford versus State of Punjab that clarified that it is an obligation on the part of the accused to furnish some explanation with respect to the incriminating evidence. So in, in Sunil Clifford's case, basically he was facing a trial for you know murder of his own wife. So the court said that whenever any incriminating evidence is put to you, you must offer your explanation. You can't simply say that I am being falsely accused. Now, if you want to take an you know, plea of alibi that you were not there when the offense was committed, you may say so that uh, I am falsely implicated. I was not even there at the spot. You may also refer to a judgment called Balinder versus State of Punjab, wherein the court has said and clarified that if the incriminating statements and incriminating circumstances are not put to the accused at the time of recording of statement under section 313, though those particular incriminating evidence cannot be used against the accused. So now, uh, uh, we'll discuss defense evidence and arguments. So after recording the statement of the accused, the court will proceed and call upon the accused to enter his defense. That provision is there under section 233 of CRPC. The accused is also a competent witness as per section 313 of CRPC. And once you are entering your defense, your defense should be consistent with the uh, suggestions that you have taken while you were uh, doing cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses, your defense should be consistent with the plea of defense that you have taken in your uh, statement of accused, and your defense should be in support of whatever plea you have already taken, whatever your strategy, strategy and whatever your defense points are. Once your defense uh, Evidence is over. The court will thereafter hear the arguments and will appreciate the evidence recorded uh, in the case. After hearing the arguments, the court will give a judgment in the case. There could be a possibility that there could be a conviction, or there could be a possibility that your, uh, you know, your client may get an acquittal. However, if your client is uh, convicted by the court, you need to be mindful of the fact that there has to be a separate hearing when the court will consider argument on sentence. Now the court now the court has given a finding that you have convicted, your client is convicted, the sentence of hearing is separate. Now typically in, in, in the sentence and the hearing you will argue the you know social condition of the accused. Maybe you can argue that he has family, he has people to take care of, you can argue his young age, you can you know argue his you know chances of reformation, his young age and so on and so forth. So this is basically, you know, uh, uh, the process uh, of trial. This is the bird's eye view. Of course, you know, when once the trial is there, you will face uh, uh, several situations, and you need to examine that particular situation as and when it comes. So uh, I'll proceed, and I will also talk about the concept of uh, corporate criminal liability. So, in in Assistant Commissioner versus Valiapa Textile. You know, the court by a majority decision held that a corporation where the offense is punishable with a mandatory imprisonment, the corporation cannot be convicted for such offenses. So th this was the law uh, let down by the you know, majority of the judges in the repair textiles. However, this question again came uh, for consideration. Uh, can you please hold on? So we, we've uh, inadvertently missed one uh, slide. Uh, there is you know, another judgment called uh, standard chartered judgment wherein the court overruled the decision uh, given by Valiapa Textile and the court applied a theory wherein the court said the law does not contemplate uh, that it will do something impossible, rather it will, it will ignore that thing and will do something that it can be done. Meaning thereby, if the offense is punishable with a mandatory imprisonment and with fine, the court may not 
uh, impose the punishment of imprisonment because a company, being a juristic person, cannot be imprisoned. So rather, the company will be convicted and the company will be fined instead of uh, the order of conviction. So now, another concept uh, was evolved in Iridium's case, Iridium versus uh, Motorola. In this case, it was it, it was argued that there are certain mens rea offenses where your uh, you know mens rea your guilty mind is one of the relevant factor like cheating. So the case of cheating is made out if there was mens rea to commit the offense of cheating. Now it was argued in Iridium's case that since a company is a natural person, I'm sorry, since the company is a juristic person and not a natural person, the company is unable to commit any offense that involves a mens rea. So in that situation, uh, the court uh, relied upon an English judgment of Tesco and the court held that it is the mens rea of the individuals of the company, the officers of the company that will be imposed on the company and the company can be convicted for offenses that, uh, that, that should involve mens rea. So the relevant excerpts of this judgment is 63. I you know, encourage all the law students or all the practitioners to read these judgments, Valepa Textile, Standard Chartered, Iridium versus Motorola. Now, you know, there, there was an interesting uh, uh, situation that came in Sunit Bhatia's Mithil case. Now what happened? The concept of alter ego is applied and the mens rea of an individual is imposed to the uh, to the company and the company is held liable for the offenses committed by the individual however in sunil bharti mittal's case what has happened the court noted that there is no reverse application of alter ego now if the company is an accused it is not automatically that any director is an accused reverse is possible if there is a director who has committed a b c offenses his alter ego, his mens rea will be imputed to the company and both that director or that officer will be prosecuted along with the company. Now consider a situation where there is a company that is, you know, that is an accused. However, a director X has not played any role. So reverse alter ego is not applicable. Alter ego of the company will not be imputed on the individual. So Sunil Maharti Mittal is, you know, one such interesting case you should all read. And uh, just to give you a brief, you know, uh, important point on vicarious liability, it is again a, you know, important concept. The, our criminal justice system does not recognize the concept of vicarious liability. So meaning thereby, if, if one person has committed an offense, it is not necessary if there are two partners, one of the partners has committed an offense, you can't impute, uh, impute the concept of vicarious liability and make his part partner also liable. So you need to ensure that whenever you are drafting a complaint, if you want to implicate all partners, you, you have to ensure that you will demonstrate in your complaint that what role has been played by all individuals in committing that offense. So Maksud Sayyid versus State of Gujarat is, you know, one judgment which again reiterates and lays down the law that there is no vicarious liability in uh, IPC. However, there are special statute like Negotiable Instruments Act where a person is my vicariously made liable for the uh, offense committed by the company by, of, by way of legal fiction. So it is an exception. So you need to see if your case is covered by any special statute like Negotiable Instrument Act. So in Negotiable Instrument Act, Section 141 says that every person with whom's negligence commission such offense has happened, that person will also be liable. So it is, it is by way of an exception. These uh, vicarious liability principles are contained in special act. However, I clarify that Indian Penal Court does not have any concept of vicarious liability. So now again, I will you know, talk about conspiracy, what criminal conspiracy means. So it is basically uh, when two or more person agree to do or cause to be done an illegal act or an act which is not illegal by illegal means, such an agreement is a criminal conspiracy. 
So the element of criminal conspiracy are an object to be accomplished, a plan or a scheme, a bonding means to accomplish that object, an agreement or understanding between two or more accused persons whereby they become definitely committed to cooperate for the accomplishment of the object by means of embodied in the agreement or by any effectual means in the jurisdiction where the statute required an overt act. So you may read uh, a classic case on conspiracy that is Yakub Abdul Memon versus State of Maharashtra. So it says that if there is a case of conspiracy and there are three people in the conspiracy and in furtherance of that particular conspiracy, A commits an offense, B and C have not per se committed any offense. However, every individual will be liable for all the offenses committed by any one of them in furtherance of the conspiracy. So in again, you know, there was a, a very interesting uh, case called uh, Somna Thapa. So Somna Thapa was basically a police officer. So he allowed smuggling of RDX when the Mumbai uh, blast happened in 1993. So he argued that though he, you know, the, the case of the prosecution is that he, he uh, connived with the accused and he allowed entry of the RDX. However, he never knew what is the ultimate uh, objective of the conspiracy in that situation, the court held that, you know, it may be a situation that, you know, all the accused person may not be aware of ultimate object of the conspiracy. However, they may still be liable. So it is again, a very uh, interesting and a must read case on conspiracy. Uh, that is so uh, state of Maharashtra versus Somnath Thapa. So, you know, this was our last slide and uh, I would, you know, like to conclude this lecture. And uh, we can proceed, Vijayatri, you know, uh, to question and answers. Yeah, so um, we'll uh, now take up uh, the questions. I think um, what we can possibly do is um, rather than uh, taking uh, questions which are uh, subjective, let us uh, take questions which are more, more related to the concepts so that uh, if there are any concepts which uh, are still not clear with our participants. I think uh, we could uh, start addressing those first. And uh, towards the end, if we do have some more time, then we can take up uh, some uh, specific uh, questions. So we'll first take up uh, the conceptual questions uh, where uh, some of our participants have uh, uh, asked us uh, to clarify on certain uh, very basic criminal law terms. So we'll take up those questions first. All right. Um, so there's one question uh, which I feel is uh, important. Um, if there is an FIR that has been filed, whether one should go for quashing of FIR, is it better or worse than going for closure report? See, uh, that depends on the, you know, uh, initially I thought that I will take a topic of quashing also in this you know presentation, but you know, due to the paucity of time, you know, I couldn't take that topic. So you need to read a judgment called Bhajan Lal. So in Bhajan Lal, there are Bhajan Lal versus state of Haryana. So there are seven principal uh, that are shared, that are uh, enunciated by the court in Bhajan Lal. If you accept the case of the prosecution as correct, so whatever is stated in the complaint as correct, and still it does not uh, make any offense, so it basically says the term used there is that if, you know, if you uh, accept the case of the prosecution on the face value, and despite that, you know, they don't make a case, then you should definitely take a case, uh, you know, chance uh, uh, before question. All right. You can read uh, Bhajan Lal. Bhajan Lal. Yes. Bhajan Lal, yeah. All right. Um, now, uh, there is another question. Um, in case there is a delay in framing of charges, what is the limitation period? See, there is no limitation period as such. So we are doing a trial, you know, where, you know, since, uh, you know, three years, no uh, uh, charges have, have yet to be framed. So as such, there is no such remedy. So if you are, you know, appearing for, a, you know, complainant side, you may file a writ before the court and you can seek some sort of uh, speedy disposal order from the constitutional court that is high court. 
you can either file a 226 you can also file a 227 uh, petition article mm -hmm. 227 petition before the high court right uh, now uh, why can't uh, the promoters of company be held liable if uh, if a company is held uh, liable as a company will only operate through its uh, promoters then why is there a reversal of the ego not valid so what happens is that again you need to go back to the basic you know fundamental that is uh, there is no vicarious liability in the penal court so uh, you know if you've seen my first slide that says that you need to basically you know enumerate each role played by an individual so if if somebody has not played role in the commission of the offense then per se he is not liable because there is no vicarious liability you know in the penal court so what has happened uh, if you see uh, 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 if you see uh, if you see sunil bharti's case you will get a clarity where the court said that you know though the company there is material against the company however there is no material evidence against the accused per se to say that he has committed any offense or he has played some part in the commission of the offense so if it is not there there cannot be uh, uh, you know a case against him so mostly what happens you know in 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 practical in practical sense what happens is whenever there is a prosecution launch against any of the director the first defense the director says that uh, there cannot be any fir against me there is against uh, one case uh, i think by delhi high court called india info line limited i can you know uh, share that uh, with separately and uh, it is only because there is no vicarious liability therefore that promoter is not liable now the next uh, question again uh, uh, thank you for posting this question i think this question has been posted twice uh, we missed it out earlier what are the provisions in law for a search for a missing person who is mentally unsound see vinu i haven't really done uh, you know uh, any case i think you uh, what i remember is that you file a missing complaint before the before the concerned police and uh, and it's finding a police finding a person is just like investigating it is it is it, there could be a case that uh, he has gone uh, out of his own will you need to see the provisions of you know mental health act and uh, i haven't had you know the occasion in the past to you know work on you know this subject and i can uh, get back to the uh, person and i would like to thank him for uh, raising this question this this is a you know food for thought for me and now again a very conceptual question what is the difference between criminal conspiracy and common intention see criminal conspiracy is that you know uh, that there is an agreement to do a particular uh, thing if you read nalini's judgment and somna thapa's judgment there is a very thin line that you know uh, that is there between these two uh, sections so conspiracy is where where you agree to do a particular thing now the common intention could be whenever you are doing a particular thing you 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 intend that you want to commit that offense however the offense of uh, conspiracy is complete whenever there is an agreement no overt act is required so if, tomorrow if i you know enter into a conspiracy to kill someone it is not required that i do any overt act in pursuance of that conspiracy that agreement is an offense per se however in, in common intention you must do an overt act and you know do something in furtherance of your common intention right uh, now i think we'll take uh, two or three more questions uh, what is the difference in discharge and acquittal and uh, whether there is any difference in uh, the status of both see discharge amounts to acquittal can you uh, repeat the question i i missed your question yes uh, what is the difference uh, in discharge and acquittal and is there any difference in the status of both there is no such difference the discharge amounts to acquittal all right yeah um okay uh, now can police file charge sheet against those accused who are under custody leaving out those who are absconding yes in fact in fact if you if you read there was an interesting case you know that we 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 read you know it was bofors case the police can also file a charge sheet against a dead person 
because charge sheet is only a conclusion of an investigation if the police right. comes to a conclusion that x person has committed the offense and he is no more the charge sheet will say that only hmm. and since the person is not there proceedings will be abated right uh, now again uh, there's a nice uh, query from uh, mr james uh, i think he had introduced himself uh, in the beginning also on chat I think he's an uh, assistant professor at a university uh, so the question is uh, please explain a latest case law related to trial by court of sessions uh trial by court of sessions so see uh, you need to see what on what point you need a judgment so uh, whether you want it on discharge because typically what will happen is that uh, in if you read any appeal at the high court that will basically deal with whatever the trial court has done so on what point if if there is any particular point whether it's on a question of charge whether it's on a question of you know statement of accused whether it's on a question of uh defense evidence 313 so if there is any particular stage on which he wants a judgment maybe i can refer few judgments however i think uh he needs to be more specific on what point he wants a judgment right um or probably uh, you, can, be... you can you can uh, uh, you know uh, you have my email id so whatever questions they have remaining yeah. questions you may take yeah. the question and you know shoot that to me i'll respond yeah, sure. you know sure. possibly a fine sure uh, i think uh, that's a good idea because uh, we have a, a long list of questions right now but i don't think uh, we'll be able to take up all the questions uh so i think uh, one of the last questions that we could address over here in the live session is uh, what is the evidentiary value of fir see there is no evidentiary value of the fir it's just you know uh, a statement you know which cannot be used for the purposes of evidence ultimately uh, you have to uh, bring everything before the court in the form of evidence if there is a, for example if the fir is uh, if fir is not a substantial piece of evidence if the fir is at the instance of any complaint then definitely your you know complainant will come as a prosecution witness and he will say whatever he has to say before the court and at that point in time you will either contradict him you know with whatever he has stated previously or whatever he has stated during the investigative investigation under section 161 so it is not a substantial piece of evidence yeah and there are okay, now, many, yeah. there are many judgments to that effect. yeah and now uh, one of our last questions and uh, how lucrative is criminal litigation as a field for a fresh graduate in the present time since it's such a vast field like any other uh, what would you uh, would you suggest a graduate to work in the criminal field when there are already so many lawyers practicing in the criminal side see what what uh, you know if you ask honestly you know in terms of my experiences that uh, uh, there is dearth of you know young criminal lawyers in the profession so yes initially you need to you know spend time uh, you know at the trial court you may need to visit police stations you may need to do uh, you know clerical work doing to court you know elmer's room checking the records doing inspection but then again you know it it really depends upon how passionate you are about the subject if you are passionate enough and if if that really gives you that in a you know uh, enthusiasm to you know pursue criminal law as a career then you should definitely do it and uh, you know it's 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 i would say that it's it's very very lucrative and uh, again but it depends upon how passionate you are uh now again we'll take uh, just one quick question uh, uh i think we missed out this question earlier i'm sorry uh, illegal act in section 120a uh, what is an illegal act in section 120a see uh, just a minute let me just you know open it once again i don't have the occasion of um, let me just see the slide once again so he is talking about conspiracy right yeah yeah so illegal act would be uh, uh, okay just a minute so it says when two or more person agree to do or was to do an illegal act or an act which is not it so illegal illegal act would be an offense which is not permitted by law any offense so now there could be a situation where you are doing something legal now for example if you apply for a loan okay taking a loan is legal okay but if you use corrupt if you you know conspire 
and if you use corrupt measures to you know cause loss to the bank then you are you know taking off loan is legal however you are using illegal means to you know get that loan so your objective is legal but your means are you know not uh, are prohibited by law so that is doing a legal thing by illegal means and we can take rest of the questions uh, uh, i think uh, yeah uh, probably on mail or uh, kapil uh, would you like to share your mail id or how would you like it to go for i can share my email id i mean you can write it down k madan yes uh, k madan k m a b a n uh, at the rate k m a law office dot com so as we say in criminal law i would you know like to conclude i was uh, uh, i was appearing in one uh, corruption trial matter and there is a very senior counsel called mr sushil kumar so sushil kumar once was arguing before the court and the court addressed him as learned counsel so he made a remark sir i am not learned i am still learning so i think he is maybe in his you know 70s so this is this is this is one such area wherein you know everyone is learning every day we are just getting better each and every day the point is that we should make a conscious effort to be better every day to be a learner each day when we go to work sometimes we also don't know anything sometimes we sometimes learn from others in the court sometimes we learn from juniors sometimes we learn from senior so you should your mindset should be that you will learn every day whenever whenever you will go to work so if you have that kind of you know mental conditioning you will grow by leaps and bounds right all right uh, so with this i think uh, we come to the end of uh, today's session which was on fundamentals of uh, criminal law thank you very much kapil uh, for this session and uh, we had a lot of things uh, to learn from uh, the discussion today and of course uh, thank you to all our uh, participants uh, for uh, posting your questions and uh, of course we have shared uh, kapil's mail id as well so if you have any further queries or if there are uh, any queries that you felt uh, were not answered over here you could uh, definitely mail him and uh, put up your query and have a discussion with him on that now with this uh, we close the session and uh, thank you once again and uh, please stay safe thank you everyone good night